Good morning. My name is Wen Xin Ye. I am professor of history and director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. On behalf of my colleagues in East Asian Studies on this campus, I like to extend to you a warm welcome to this conference. Now, about three years ago, a group of us gave ourselves this project to write a book on cross-strait relationships. We wanted to know what it might have been like for people living their everyday life under that set of circumstances, namely tension across the strait. And we also wanted to know how the action of the people on the ground as they conduct their activities on a daily basis in pursuit of economic, cultural, educational, and social activities might have contributed to the changing dynamics across the strait. So three years down the line and three workshops later, that is including a workshop generously hosted by Dr. Wu Yuzhan at the Institute of Political Studies at the Academia Sinica in Taipei. Here we are, our original group of paper contributors, ready to share the results of our research with the campus community and the broader public. And we are also, so as far as the volume is concerned, we see this as an opportunity to invite comments and feedbacks before we finalize our manuscript. And then we are particularly honored and delighted to be able to invite to our conference a group of distinguished speakers. And I will start off with this conference by introducing one of them, our very first featured speaker. Our ver very first featured speaker for this morning's session is Dr. Tian Hongmao, president of the Institute of National Policy Research based in Taipei. Dr. Tian to this audience actually requires no introduction. We know him, first of all, as a scholar. He is a prolific researcher who has published a large number of, um, of uh, fine research work. The recent or the outstanding titles include Government and Politics in Guomindang, China uh, between 1927 and 1937, The Great Transition, Social and Political Change in the Republic of China, Democratization in Taiwan, Implications for China, Consolidating the Third Wave Democracies, Themes and Perspectives, China under Jiang Zemin, the security environment in the Asia Pacific, and Taishang and China's economic development. In addition to this wealth of research records and um, organized edited volumes, Dr. Tian is also a diplomat. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs as well as Ambassador. He, was, he is a presidential advisor and he is a critical policy thinker with regard to cross-strait relationships and the broader issue of Taiwan's placement of itself within the global context. And then I would like to say in connection with this project that Dr. Tian has been an inspirational advisor and a friend. He was present at our very first organizing workshop, and it gives me special pleasure to welcome him to our final presentation on our project, and he's going to speak on this subject, Foundations of Cross-Strait Interactions, please.
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am very delighted to be here uh, to see everybody uh, from the group and additionally more uh, friends and others who have come to this uh, seminar. <coughs> I particularly want to thank uh, Winsin and your ABO staff for organizing uh, such an important and rather timely uh, subject matter. Uh, I know how it is uh, so difficult to get a conference organized uh, because we are doing a lot of those. Um, uh, maybe every, every conference per month this year. <coughs> so the hard work is being appreciated. <coughs> This is a special year uh, in a sense that uh, for the Coral Strait uh, on both sides of Taiwan Strait, they are celebrating something. You know. uh, they are celebrating something in conjunction with the 1911 uh, revolutions. Okay. Um, Beijing's uh, uh, society, uh, China mainland side, uh, they, will, they will celebrate a series of activities in commemorations of the Xinhai uh, revolutions, which of course you know that uh, perhaps in some way paved the way for the founding of the Chinese Communist Party one decade later. For the Republic of China in Taiwan, <coughs> This is a more important event. I suppose uh, basically means uh, the, this revolution led to the uh, founding of the Republic of China. <coughs> so there uh, will be uh, an year-round centennial celebrations going on in Taiwan. Uh, there is something in common between both sides uh, both sides respect uh, Dr. Sun Yek Sen. And both sides are obviously welcome the downfall of Manchuria, Manchuria Imperial Dynasty. <coughs> yeah. uh, let me also mention that uh, this is another year of importance uh, to the cross trade relations. That is, that is to say that uh, this year marks the 20th anniversary uh, of the establishment of the uh, Strait Exchange Foundations on Taiwan side and the Association for Relations across the Taiwan Strait uh, on uh, China mainland side. That is to say, safe versus errors that has serve so very useful purpose uh, in the 90s and more recently uh, to provide a semi-official mechanism for dialogue or bilateral negotiations on a number of functional issues. Uh, uh, under the circumstances, uh, one would suggest that the celebrations uh, on both sides should provide somewhat congenial atmosphere for cooperations in various types of activity in the hope of enriching the substance of already very close uh, cross trade uh, interactions. <clears throat> However, having said that, we know that uh, there are political challenges ahead, uh, uh, particularly in this year. There will be uh, national elections, uh, uh, presidential and legislative elections, most likely uh, to be combined in the beginning of next year, according to the latest uh, statement of the Central Election Commission. Now, 
the nomination activities uh, in both parties already, already are heating up. By summer of this year, certainly uh, midsummer, one expects the nomination process will be completed. Uh, during the course of the second half of the year, there will be uh, intense mobilization uh, in the course of campaign activities. What's new, right? This is Taiwan every year. Okay. <laughs> Um, but in this case, however, however, one should note the fact that uh, cross-strait uh, relations, uh, or for that matter, President Mao's uh, mainland policy, uh, may become an issue for public debate, uh, something that will be quite different from the elections of last year where uh, uh, election only uh, concern uh, local uh, uh, municipal uh, executive and uh, city councilmen. Uh, uh, perhaps last point, one also need to add that uh, looking ahead, uh, next year, most likely, as you know, in the fall next year, uh, there will be uh, leadership change in the aftermath of the CCP 18th Party Congress. Uh, many of the major posts uh, uh, will be uh, changed. There will be a, a almost a wholesale turnover of leadership in China. What does that mean? Well, it may be too early to forecast, but it is important that we bear that in mind. <coughs> uh, in my last trip to uh, Berkeley, to this uh, uh, great, and I may add liberal, university, <coughs> uh, I had a pleasure of uh, joining uh, Winston and others uh, for this uh, seminar, this project. Uh, at that time, I remember it was in early November, 2008, I made a point of saying, or forecasting, it doesn't require a lot of intelligence to forecast, by the way, at that time, that uh, President Ma, who, who was already elected uh, and inaugurated, will pursue uh, a fundamental policy change with regard to uh, the cross-strait relations. I think it has turned out to be that way. At that time, uh, uh, President Ma and his uh, uh, running mate, uh, Mr. Xiao, uh, the so-called Ma Xiao team, as well as uh, the Kuomintang uh, uh, legislative uh, candidates, they both won uh, landslide uh, victories. Uh, in the case of the national legislature, the KMT uh, uh, occupy about three quarters of the seats. This was one of the uh, most important victory uh, for the party in recent memory, uh, which enabled President Ma to move on to pursue his policies of detente with China. <coughs> his team, <coughs> and one of the able person in the team is with us today, uh, his team uh, uh, engaged in a series of groundbreaking uh, uh, measures, such as, for example, subsequently, 15 agreements uh, between both sides was, uh, was signed, and that there, was, there has been accelerating pace of interaction and broadening, broadening in scope in areas of functional cooperation. Uh, having made this remark, uh, let me summarize uh, briefly what I would like to say uh, in the following. I would like to briefly uh, examine the dimensions of interactions. Uh, secondly, I would venture to 
uh, suggest what is the politics that makes this development possible. And thirdly, I will move on uh, to speculate uh, the future prospect. And then I will conclude by making short, three short statements. Now let's get back to uh, the various dimensions of interactions uh, that has transpired. The focus uh, is on the last three years. Okay. Even though we understand uh, the relations across the Taiwan Strait have not occurred just recently, they can be traced back in some cases uh, to 20 years ago. Uh, but I think uh, uh, much of the interaction uh, activities uh, has gained a growing importance uh, during the last uh, two and a half years. <coughs> okay. So in terms of the in, uh, dimensions of interaction, uh, let me briefly um, point out several. Uh, I think all of this will be quite brief because we have two days of more uh, uh, detailed discussion. <clears throat> the first point I'd like to say is that <clears throat> uh, uh, there has been very intensification of economic ties uh, between both sides. Okay. There are important factors uh, that motivate motivated uh, Taiwanese investment uh, on the mainland. Uh, this include globalization of the economy, which necessitated Taiwanese businessmen to go over there. China's rich human and other resources, low cost uh, 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 products, you know, accessible uh, to greater varieties of market overseas and so on and so forth. Compa comparable event, com comparable, competitive, sorry, competitive advantage in uh, culture and language, which is cultural affinity, and also both are using the common language, geographic uh, proximity, and historical ties. Uh, mutual complementarities of economic needs. All of these serve uh, as among some of the important factors that draw Taiwanese uh, investors uh, to China mainland, uh, to China mainland. And obviously, um, uh, policies adopted at the high levels of both sides uh, make it even more uh, possible uh, in the case of Taiwan, uh, President Ma's policy initiative to promote a wide range of liberalization certainly contribute to that. Okay. In terms of economic uh, uh, relationship, I think we uh, probably uh, should agree that in a, uh, trade and investment uh, stand out as two uh, vital areas. Uh, uh, in the areas of uh, uh, trade, uh, certainly uh, when President Ma uh, came into office in uh, 2008, it was untimely. Uh, the financial crisis of the world and economic recessions had just arrived. So the cross-strait trade uh, uh, took a little downward trend. And, and went down uh, far, farther in a year 2009. But last year, uh, the, the trade growth has become quite spectacular, uh, increasing by 41.7% in two-way trade. Uh, what is the amount of total trade between both sides? Uh, Really, um, I have you know, done my own studies and 
have uh, so far discovered that there is no uh, agreed upon figure. Um, it depends upon who is calculating and, and who are making the studies. Uh, the figures that I have come across, I can uh, uh, tell you uh, uh, something for your reference. In, in the year uh, 2010, according to Taiwan statistics, statistics uh, uh, the cross trade tray uh, stood at 100, $113 billion dollars. Uh, excluding uh, Hong Kong, excluding Hong Kong. The number, obviously, would be higher or considerably higher if we include Hong Kong. In fact, one source from uh, China mainland indicates uh, a figure as high as $145 billion, just announced recently. That includes the figures of trade between Taiwan and Hong Kong. Oh. So whether it is uh, at a lower level, so 113 billion, or it is at the highest level, so 145 billion, uh, the figure obviously is very big. Oh. Uh, so big that uh, Taiwan's export uh, to the China market now represent or accounts for somewhere around 41.5% of Taiwan's total exports. Okay. What about investment? Again, uh, this is a difficult uh, area to uh, come up with a reliable uh, statistic. Uh, uh, all of the figures cited uh, in terms of accumulative amount over the years have been subject to dispute uh, and some of the figures provided by official sources are judged to be uh, grossly inadequate. Yeah. So I don't know what to offer you. Uh, I can offer you uh, uh, a study done last year based on the calculations of one respectable scholar on a subject matter for the periods of 1988 to 2008. Uh, Taiwan's investment uh, in the mainland uh, was more was about to be somewhere around uh, one thousand well one hundred sixty six point five billion dollars. <coughs> okay, this is to say that by the end of last year, the figure uh, accordingly uh, would probably uh, go up to. Uh, somewhere closer to 200 billion. <clears throat> okay. Other studies that I have come across uh, suggest uh, statistical figures are uh, uh, quite large, considerably uh, bigger than the figures that I cited. Okay. In other words, you know, somewhere about that uh, or more. Uh, Douglas Paul, for example, uh, Doug Paul uh, told me, uh, this was already a few years ago, that uh, uh, one figure used by one American uh, 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 government uh, you know, uh, department was in excess of 200 million uh, US dollars. Uh, investment, uh, or uh, by the Taiwanese uh, has actually accounted for somewhere around 70% of Taiwan's total FDI, 70% going to China. <coughs> uh, because of the cross trade, uh, you know, Taiwan's uh, export dependency, as well as uh, over concentrations of investment, uh, overseas investment in China, this had, this had led to uh, some scholar to conclude that this represents a sort of partner concentration and asymmetric uh, reliance. 
uh, more or less, you know, uh, needing one-sided. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not a sort of a uh, even type of a economic relationship. Uh, although we know that um, uh, uh, Beijing uh, is uh, uh, taking steps to try to correct this uh, by proposing to in, in, uh, inject more uh, China's investment uh, capital to Taiwan and so on and so forth. But the consideration in Taipei is, uh, is beyond com pure commercial uh, you know, uh, uh, factor alone. It's, it's, it, they involve more complicated political and security calculations. Uh, the, fig the figure that I, I have cited in terms of trade and investment uh, uh, have resulted in forming uh, extensive interlocking commercial interests between both sides. Or for that matter, one can say that uh, this has uh, led to some kind of de facto economic integration in the making. <coughs> in de facto, uh, now other, uh, other dimensions of the interaction uh, that has caught uh, many attention is the implementations during the Ma administrations of the so-called three links, <coughs> which eventually constructed some kind of infrastructures, a human infrastructure or infrastructure for, uh, for transactions of uh, goods, etc. All right. Since December, 2008, uh, China has assigned uh, 48 seaports and 11 uh, river ports uh, for the purpose of direct shipping with Taiwan. Uh, conversely, Taiwan has uh, opened up 11 seaports for the purpose of direct shipping. Um, obviously, it is uh, much smaller. You know, we can only offer 11. You know. <coughs> Uh, in terms of air links, uh, uh, now uh, the direct flight uh, uh, are serving 20 cities of China and eight cities in Taiwan. The weekly flights uh, now reach to 270, uh, which is equally divided between airlines of both sides. Uh, I think uh, the airline industries are pushing for more flights, um, although uh, uh, this is an uh, issue that uh, I have no answer. Maybe Dr. Uh, Su later on can give you answer, more, more satisfactory answer. Um, so all in all, during uh, uh, my angel's administration, there has been over 50,000 direct flights. Uh, between both sides, uh, carrying now uh, over 9.4 million passengers uh, in the course of doing that. The human interactions certainly uh, is part of a you know, functional uh, uh, interaction between both sides that is very important. Okay. Now, Taiwan passengers traveling to China average ab ab about 4.6 million and the Chinese travelers from mainland to Taiwan uh, remain quite small. Although uh, in the year uh, of 2010, uh, finally it reached to 1.64 million, 164 million um, passengers from China mainland. Uh, it is expected to go even higher uh, today as officials have promised uh, to allow for more individualized trips uh, uh, to, to Taiwan. Uh, this, time, this kind of a direct flight um, uh, or availabilities of uh, more uh, frequent flights, uh, shorter uh, distance and, and, and so on and so forth, have quietly, but not so inconspicuously, change the lifestyle 
of many people uh, in Taiwan, particularly those who live in the urban areas, so that they are able to travel back and forth. You know, for for instance, yeah, uh, going to going to Shanghai uh, in the Friday afternoon. You know, arriving there in one and a half hours, uh, having a dinner with a friend, and then spend four hours playing mahjong. You know. <clears throat> uh, it is not a fiction anymore. This is true. Okay. Um, so uh, the uh, the three links have drawn uh, people uh, closer to one, one another uh, by virtue of providing many uh, direct flight. Uh, additionally, one can move on to talk about uh, growing interactions in areas of social, cultural, educational scientific academic uh, realms, okay. uh, and, uh, because of time, let me uh, be brief on that. Okay. Uh, social, exchanges, social exchanges broadly defined have been very extensive. Uh, uh, I think the, mo uh, the first one not noticed is intermarriage, of course. There are over 300,000 you know, uh, uh, men and uh, uh, women married to um, Taiwanese men. Most of them are now registered, uh, resident. Uh, approximately, you know, about 1.5 million uh, Taiwanese uh, businessmen, uh, managerial staff, workers, and their families uh, are living uh, in China, <clears throat> that is to say that they probably spend, you know, six months or more during the year uh, in on the mainland. Okay. There are many, many uh, uh, NGO, great numbers of uh, non-governmental organizations, association that uh, include those of religious nature. Uh, business community, professional group, uh, issue-oriented group, those who are concerned about ecological matters and so on and so forth, have interacted very frequently. Uh, so frequent that it's probably going faster than the government can call up in their official registration of tracking of those movements. In the same token, uh, the cultural and educational interaction are also uh, very flourishing uh, uh, in the areas of uh, performing arts, uh, scholarly exchanges, university ties, and more and more uh, students going both ways to studies. Uh, uh, the ROC government's uh, Ministry of Education finally, last year, you know, approve uh, for Taiwan to recognize uh, diplomas of students from the mainland who study in 41 uh, better known universities. Uh, moreover, uh, now uh, Taiwan uh, allow uh, students from China mainland uh, to study in Taiwan's universities for degrees. The figure that I have come across uh, is that for this year, about 130, 34 Taiwan universities will accept over 2,000 uh, students for studying degrees in Taiwan. If, we, if one add to short-term uh, studies, then the total numbers of Chinese students uh, in Taiwan uh, this year will be somewhere around 7,000. That's a figure coming from about zero 20 years ago. Okay, so it is also a, a change of great importance. The final point is the increasing uh, penetration, uh, increasing levels of uh, media uh, cross 
penetration on both sides. Uh, more and more media reporting about China's uh, event, and perhaps, you know, in due course, uh, Taiwan's mass media uh, can be partially or entirely owned uh, by China's capitals. Although I would have to say that uh, 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 our government has taken this with caution. Uh, with caution. Uh, the last point uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, forming inter interactions between both sides. Perhaps you have noticed that last year uh, there was a great number of official litigation going from uh, China mainland to Taiwan. Most of them uh, were led by leaders of provinces and city. <coughs> this include uh, party secretary, uh, you know, deputy secretary, provincial governors, vice governors, city mayors, and so on and so forth. Uh, I realized that those missions are intended, were intended to promote uh, uh, frequencies of interaction, giving it a little bit of political flavor. Uh, but uh, those delegations uh, often combine both uh, pur purchasing missions, uh, buying goods uh, in Taiwan, as well as uh, solicitations of investment of Taiwanese capital uh, to invest in China. Uh, so they came to Taiwan, and they always have very busy schedule. Okay. Some of them were ex extremely popular, uh, uh, back and forth. Um, at any rate, um, the official level context has become quite routine. Uh, no longer it is viewed with any degree of political you know, sensitivity, even though uh, leaders of the delegation in some cases uh, is actually members of the Communist Party Central Committee. <clears throat> I, have, I have not seen a members of the party bureau leading the delegation yet, although we can say that this will not happen sometime this year. Okay. On the other hand, um, mean, uh, officials at a higher level, the central government, the government level, is more, more, more restricted. <clears throat> uh, to be more restricted doesn't mean that there has not been contacts. Uh, communications and visit. Uh, we have noticed, for example, uh, Minister of Culture, uh, Minister of Science have visited Taiwan. And the heads of those departments, uh, ministerial, at ministerial level, there has been contact, uh, there has been an open meeting other ministries that deal with uh, transportation, commerce, uh, also have, have, have engaged in <coughs> contact. Uh, may not be uh, at many ministerial level, but certainly vice ministers are immediately below that. Uh, the, the official context has become something of a routine matter uh, whenever something needs to be discussed. Uh, to sum up, uh, expanding ties, uh, in my opinion, has led to blurring of social cultural barriers, uh, forming interlocking social networks, and uh, fostering uh, common economic bonds. <coughs> okay, uh, as de facto integration set in motion. Uh, the overall move momentum of functional integration uh, strengthen, uh, strengthen foundations for generalized reciprocities and common expectations. At this point, one recalls uh, 
are the words of the famous political scientist Karl Deutsch. Uh, uh, if we can borrow his concept, uh, one may venture to suggest that the process uh, somehow uh, represents something. Uh, it looks like, you know, we are seeing um, uh, early signs of the formations of some kind of security community across the Taiwan Strait, whereby perhaps war becomes unlikely. <laughs> Let me turn to uh, the second point, which is what is the politics that makes this, this type of development possible? There are several key points. I want to go uh, over quickly. One uh, is uh, uh, establishments of mutual trust between KMT and CCP leaders. The force of that was a 2005 historic trip uh, by the former Vice President Yan Zhan, who was the KMT party chairman. Since then, uh, according to a media report, uh, uh, Mr. Den and Mr. Hu has, have established a personal friendship. Okay. Uh, they have, in the course of that, uh, establish a very useful uh, and credible communication line and have a very strong uh, personal bond. One of the side effects of the trip was the birth of a KMT CCP annual forum. Uh, every year, uh, uh, representative teams from both sides meet to discuss issues of their common interests, and often uh, publicize uh, the agreement they have reached. Okay. So in addition to uh, Dan Zan's uh, historic trip, one can also cite the second uh, point. A very important point is that upon uh, coming to power, President Ma accepted the One China principle. <clears throat> uh, uh, obviously, in accordance uh, with uh, the so called 1992 uh, consensus formula. Okay. I, I will not want to go in, into the details of that because of the time factor. I think later on we can hear Dr. Su uh, explaining that. Because indeed, you know, uh, the Taiwan uh, media has suggested that the 1992 consensus was the term ably invented by Lac de Su. Okay. So it has uh, a certain element of ambiguity. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, it has provided a foundation uh, for the restorations of contact between both sides. Okay. Uh, that President Ma uh, uh, Early on in his administration, also openly declared his policies of no unification, no independence, and all, no arms conflict. Uh, I think for our purpose, uh, the key term here is no independence. Uh, so if you combine the two, that is to say that President Ma's acceptance of one China and also uh, opposed to independence. Uh, uh, clearly, one can understand that the Beijing authorities uh, must be pleased with President Ma's new policies, hence provide the political background uh, for uh, the, the subsequent uh, development uh, in the broad areas of economic, social, cultural uh, context. Just about seven months uh, following uh, Ma's inauguration, at the end of December 2008, uh, uh, President Hu Jintao, on the other side, uh, put forward his six-point policy outline uh, regarding the cross-strait uh, relations. Uh, to be very brief, uh, let me just say that uh, 
this six point <laughs> were calling for uh, a broad uh, spectrum of interactions and exchanges uh, across economic, culture, social, educational, and scientific uh, uh, fields. Okay. And that uh, uh, the outlines also propose uh, uh, some kind of agreement uh, to end the state of hostility across the street and to engage in political dialogue uh, with the goal of concluding uh, some kind of peace agreement. All of this suggests that both sides, you know, uh, are departing from the past by taking action to move uh, forward in the directions of closer relationship. Uh, I, I believe that this political trust and common adherence uh, to one China framework lays the foundations for number one, subsequent ag agreement and implementations of the three links. Number two, the signatures of economic cooperation framework agreement last year, and the establishment of an economic cooperation council to serve as institutional instrument for future substantive economic negotiations. Number three, the building of crucial infrastructure in social economic context and dialogue. And number four, uh, one perhaps can also add that this development across the street uh, have received uh, official endorsement from the Obama administration. <coughs> This is an important factor that helps reduce Taiwan's domestic and foreign apprehension. Uh, I will start with that there on this point. Okay. Now, the future prospect. In spite of all of this uh, movement, development, which are very fast, uh, okay, we also see certain elements of uncertainty. Uh, in the days ahead. <clears throat> uh, the fourth point uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be cited is uh, basically the fragility, the fragility of the foundations. That is to say that I think uh, the foundation may still be somewhat fragile. <clears throat> okay. Beijing, number one, uh, Beijing has defined the current relationship as peace development, quote unquote, which is a process that will accumulate support and strengthen foundation, uh, eventually leading to peaceful unification as the end game. Okay. The second point to be noticed in terms of the future prospect uh, it's an issue related to the questions of whether or not uh, the economic benefit has spilled over uh, to the political side. Uh, public opinion survey shows uh, some mixed results, uh, uh, more skewed uh, to a uh, somewhat, you know, uh, segregations of politics from economy. Let me uh, cite one recent uh, opinion poll by a credible magazine called Global Views magazine. Uh, <coughs> the Global Views magazine uh, concluded an opinion poll uh, in October last year, in which, among other things, uh, it indicated that uh, of the people who were poor, 51.2% uh, of them were in favor of maintaining status quo. This is the policy 
that has been advocated by President Ma's administration. However, 29% were still in favor of independence, and 7.5% were in favor of unification. So, uh, in other words, uh, uh, to promote unification at this point, Kuyere has still uh, some political uh, obstacle to overcome in Taiwan. <coughs> uh, moreover, uh, periodic surveys by uh, Republic of China's Men and Affairs Council had indicated a strong Taiwan and uh, identity that persists uh, in the populace. Okay. These are all very troublesome, I'm sure, insofar as uh, Beijing's policy is concerned. Uh, and relatedly, I may also add that uh, the Democratic Progressive Party, meaning the largest opposition party, uh, uh, still uh, taking a stand in favor of political separatism. Although uh, there are considerable efforts, I, may, I will emphasize, there are considerable efforts uh, being made uh, to foster a more conciliatory stand. Uh, uh, what effect will come out of this, um, we don't know. But I think it's a process of happening. Uh, uh, one certainly hope that uh, you know uh, uh, the, the policies uh, modification uh, will make it possible uh, for future dialogue, uh, not only uh, between DPP and KMT, but also between DPP and CCP as a party. Uh, well. Now, the political uh, climate in Taiwan also is changing. Uh, uh, looking toward the future, uh, this is a point uh, that one um, needs to keep in mind to uh, make it somewhat more difficult. Uh, almost three years ago, President Ma enjoyed tremendous popularity. <laughs> And the Kuomintang Party controls three quarters of the seat in the legislature. But for a variety of reasons, some of which beyond Ma's own control, his popularity has declined from the peak of 2008. One of the, one of the reasons was due to um, uh, natural calamities that occurred two years ago. Okay. And you may notice that nowadays, um, most of the ruling parties throughout the industrialized democracy are in trouble. Okay. Uh, there are simply very difficult issues to handle for government uh, in power. Okay. And certainly President Ma does not have as much uh, political arsenal for him to deal, to address to uh, the cross trade issue as much as he likes. Uh, uh, namely, he may have to make some, some compromise uh, insofar as ideal and reality is concerned. And secondly, uh, the DPP, who is looked uh, virtually in disarray three, three years ago, seems to have regrouped it, uh, regrouped it from its 2008 law point. Uh, uh, it is now uh, at a point that seems ready uh, to pose uh, some degree of challenge to the Kuomintang in the forthcoming national elections, uh, something that uh, certainly President Ma uh, would not take it lightly. <coughs> uh, number three, a revitalized uh, DPP uh, may be ready now uh, i repeat maybe you know it it's, it has element of speculation here may be ready to enter a three way 
uh, discourse and cross-trade relations, which they refuse in the past. Uh, that is to say that to enter some kind of more meaningful discussion at home within Taiwan, uh, bipartisan discussion, and then across the street, hopefully, some kind of dialogue could occur uh, uh, with the CCP. Uh, uh, in other words, the future interactions uh, between uh, both sides of Taiwan's trade could become more complicated as the DPP uh, uh, grows uh, stronger and becoming more assertive in entering the cause of dialogue. <coughs> uh, what, about what about next national election, which I also uh, believe to be an important point that one keep in mind in uh, speculations of future prospects of the cross strait contact. There will be presidential election, as I pointed out, originally scheduled for March, uh, and then uh, also elections of the entire members of the legislative yen, uh, supposedly uh, originally to be held either in December or early January. My understanding in reading the newspaper is that the Central uh, Election Commission are uh, most likely to favor uh, combine the two elections into one. Uh, I don't know what are the political forces behind it, but uh, I take you know, the commission's word for it that it is very likely to have the two elections uh, occur. Uh, if this turn out to be the case, one likely date for that will be early January <clears throat> because the LY uh, new uh, legislative end has to convene before February 1st. Okay. Uh, that will create uh, a four month period, four months lap uh, between uh, the result of the elections of the president and the inaugurations. Uh, I point this out uh, particularly to suggest that uh, in the event, uh, should there be a regime change, uh, a DPP uh, candidate uh, wins the presidential election, uh, he will have four months to prepare or see, you know, got to be careful now, right, uh, to prepare herself or himself for an inauguration. Four months, is, four months is a long time. Anything can happen. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the results of the presidential and LY election will be crucial tests of whether the uh, current cross strait interaction will continue to hold steady or even to move forward in addressing to the more uh, sensitive political and military issues, which I think uh, uh, Beijing authority seems to be very much uh, strongly in favor of that. Okay. Under the current circumstances, uh, uh, the possibility of a DPP presidential victory uh, would have greater chance or leading to some kind of setbacks in cross-strait relations. How serious uh, the setback will be, or whether there will be a very serious uh, breakdown or disruption uh, in the interaction, uh, much depend on the election outcome, uh, obviously. You know. But I think uh, one should note the fact that Beijing's quiet effort to interact with, uh, with certain DPP circles uh, indicate that perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Beijing authorities are preparing to deal with what they may consider to be the worst case scenario, namely regime change. Uh, 
This is an outlook of my presentation. I also uh, wanted to raise some questions for discussion. You know, uh, my conclusions, briefly, uh, three points. Uh, I believe the foundations of cross-strait interaction under my administrations have proliferated, building momentum of cooperation based on certain mutual trust and reciprocity. Secondly, whether the momentum can be sustained uh, to move further in the directions of formations of an integrated community across the uh, strait depends on future political development in Taiwan and perhaps uh, China's leadership change as well. Uh, number three, politics aside, it seems to me at this point that the trend toward closer functional ties uh, between both sides I mean, it seems to be irreversible. I, conc I conclude with that. I thank you for your patience. Professor Tian, we'll now, uh, we are now open for questions, please. Yes, good to see. Please, yeah, okay. see. Oh, thank okay. you. Um, you describe a, a scenario in which most of the trends and um, factors seem to be going in a very positive direction, but uh, many in the U.S. have observed one outlier, maybe, from that pattern, which is military developments in the Straits, that there doesn't seem to be much evidence that uh, Beijing is reducing or even curtailing the growth of its military pressure on Taiwan. And in fact, now there is the uh, discussion between uh, Taipei and Washington about arms sales again and upgrading the quality of Taiwan's arms. I wonder if you could talk about how you think the military dimension fits in with the economic and political trends that you've described. Uh, I would try. It's uh, uh, normally it's not my cup of tea. You know, on military issue, I think uh, Dr. Suchi will be more qualified to address to that. But uh, whatever is worth, let me say that. Um, uh, my understanding is that China has pursued uh, fundamentally uh, three coordinated approaches to deal with uh, Taiwan. Uh, to borrow the concept from Ajiani, you know, let's say, for example, one of them will rely on normative appeal uh, to win uh, people's heart. Uh, to inject common values, you know, we are Chinese, you know, we should follow Chinese culture, China is rising, we should be proud of that, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay. And there are certain elements of people in Taiwan, uh, you know, I mean, who, 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 believe, who de believe in that. So, and China is also using this as one, one way of uh, soliciting support. The second one is by virtues of uh, Remunerations, you know, uh, some some people use the term uh, economic buyout. You know, uh, uh, China is has been making uh, conciliatory gestures, um, uh, officially referred to as uh, you know, uh, 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 concessional benefit. Uh, uh, one-sided, you know, concession or the benefit to Taiwan, etc. In a hope that uh, people would appreciate that. You go. But fundamentally speaking, uh, uh, we all know that Beijing uh, has ruled out uh, a military solution in the event that this becomes necessary. The questions of whether or not it will soon soon become necessary or exactly under what kind of scenario that they would deem it necessary uh, 
is something beyond our control, you know. Um, we, we have no point of saying anything. Uh, however, it is a fact uh, that uh, China has continued to increase deployment of missiles uh, on the other side of Taiwan Strait. Uh, presumably, among other targets, uh, Taiwan is one of them. Although one hears more and more that uh, China's military ambitions go beyond Taiwan, you know, and uh, and uh, but uh, those missiles which are being installed there are intimidating, certainly intimidating to Taiwan, you know, and um, uh, President Ma has openly uh, called for removal of the missiles, uh, and. Uh, I don't know what is the solution. That's why earlier I, I point out that uh, should President Ma be re-elected, very likely he will face the pressures from the other side uh, to deal with military questions, uh, to military issues. But certainly in the last two and a half years, even though uh, uh, in social, economic, cultural, scientific uh, arena, we have seen, you know, uh, uh, highly uh, uh, motivated policy measures uh, that have moved both sides closer to each other uh, to their liking, I think, to a large extent, you know. And uh, one can argue that if this continues to be so, maybe there's no point in using military weapons uh, against Taiwan. Maybe there are a uh, wide range of other methods that can use, for example, economic sanctions or whatever, uh, um, all these of them. But uh, it is my understanding that uh, the official policies of uh, uh, Taiwan's government, including the current administrations, uh, is in favor of maintaining a sufficient level of deterrence. <coughs> I, I, I hear uh, from media uh, disclosure that both the presidential office and members of the KMT in the legislature, by and large, are still in favor of uh, procuring um, advanced uh, weapons, including uh, F-16, C and D. I don't know if you're ready to sell, but you know some. Something to that. This is something beyond, you know, beyond us. You know, it's in Washington uh, at higher level. So it is. It is uh, something. Uh, I I I, I failed to mention that earlier. I was worried about time. I think uh, the, the military uh, installations across the strait, including uh, in also uh, Beijing's uh, highly stringent. Uh, attitude toward Taiwan's international space are among some of the major reasons why there is a considerable reservoir of political reservations, you know, about China's uh, so-called goodwill. You might say these are some of the reasons. You know. But we we have no I I don't know what to make uh, Beijing to withdraw those weapons. Or to move them, you know, to move them, they can bring them back. You know, uh, it's a it's a very tricky and difficult question that the future administration, whoever wins the election, uh, may have to face. Uh, I, you know, that's my my response. Thank you, Tom. All right. So uh, we have two hands: Tim Weston, followed by Tom Gold. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on the, que the response you just gave to Shelley Rigger's question. Um, you used at the very beginning of your talk uh, the word detente to describe uh, the Ma government's approach to Beijing, which seems absolutely suitable to me. Uh, however, when I think of detente, I think of two sides making concessions, not just one side making concessions. And I see clearly that uh, there have been great benefits to individuals and perhaps even the economy uh, in Taiwan uh, from all of the 
concessions or the conciliation rec uh, that, that has come from the Ma government. I'm wondering if you could say, tell us, explain to us how you see Beijing giving to Taiwan in this process. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I see that, especially in light of what you've just said with regard to uh, military, military, uh, continued military threat. You understand the nature of my question? Uh, more or less. Okay. <laughs> in other words, uh, you were talking about the absence of reciprocated uh, yes, or, or perhaps I'm just not seeing it very clearly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, we, we're dealing with such asymmetric power here mm -hmm. that it's hard for me to understand exactly uh, what, what Beijing sees itself giving uh, yeah. to the Taiwan side yeah. in this. Well, I, I, um, I think this is a, a sort of a, a two-related issue, I suppose. So. One is uh, uh, the concept of detente, whether or not that does necessarily include reciprocated uh, concession on both sides, which need to be equal, you know. Uh, and second is whether or not uh, there is actually uh, somewhat equal or uh, you know, concession uh, made by bo both sides. I, uh, I, my, my understanding of the term uh, the tongue does not necessitate, you know, uh, uh, reciprocated uh, concession, certainly not at an equal level. It's very difficult to compare orange with apple. You know, we have to figure out. Uh, I mean, we're talking about reductions or tensions, you know, by uh, taking a series of steps or whatever uh, to make it possible. You know, uh, one, ex one may expect the other side to do more and vice versa, okay. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, I, in answering that, I, I feel reluctant to put myself in a position of having to defend China's position, you know, uh, uh, you know to argue, oh, they, you know, they have, I think we, we have uh, friends from Beijing who may later on give us, you know, his view <laughs> about what uh, Beijing has already met in concessions. Uh, they may say, oh, you know, we opened out 27 cities, now you can fly, you know, so that you can come here, travel more direct, more frequently, and so on and so forth. And they are making it easier for Taiwanese investors to invest. They give more conciliatory terms for Taiwanese speculators to own land in China to make money, you know. Uh, which are not available to uh, Americans and Japanese and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, they, can, they can also say that, oh, now, you know, uh, you can send your delegation to uh, the annual uh, WHA uh, uh, conventions, you know, although, although you know, uh, it, it's an important breakthrough, but some people are not totally satisfied, and that I think they'd like to see uh, something and go further than that, well, for instance, you know. And um, they can say that, oh, we are, you know, we are uh, buying uh, missions, you know, uh, just that uh, Taiwan used to send buying uh, mission to the U.S., and China is doing that, you know, to buy up a lot of uh, stuff, you know, more and more buy up, uh, you know, agriculture produces uh, seafood from southern, Ch southern Taiwan, to make uh, DPP supporters feel better, you know, and uh, it has political calculation as well. But not exclusively. I think they are also buying industrial product uh, from Taiwan, and uh, uh, exactly how much of, of that is beneficial to anybody, you know. Um, how much uh, implementations of a non figure that remain uh, to be studied, you know, there's some argument about. Um, uh, you know, not all of the figures that they announced actually have turned out to be true, etc. But anyway, they, they see this as uh, concessionary. And also, you know, in, t in the diplomatic uh, front, they may see, oh, you know, we now no longer, you know, uh, uh, forcefully uh, uh, keep you out of uh, formal diplomatic circles. In some instances, there's, there's, there's some some degree of diplomatic truth or whatever uh, among countries that have diplomatic tie with us. They try to stay away from that, you know, so to speak. 
And, and uh, I'm arguing for China by far. I, I, you know, I, but anyway, I'm citing some example that I know that I think they would consider, among other things, this would be you know, con unconcessionary uh, on their part. Yeah. But uh, uh, I'm relying on Dr. Su Chi to tell you more. <laughs> and also our friend uh, uh, from Tsinghua University you know, later on tomorrow, right? Uh, we, I would like to hear you know, his comment on those issues as well. We have time for a, a final question. Professor yeah. Gold, please. Um, thanks for your usual uh, comprehensive overview. Great way to get this uh, seminar underway. You've been in this game for a very long time. And I'm wondering, there's all this talk about hushang liaojie, right? Mutual understanding. You use the word trust a lot. Do you really, f and, and this sort of grows out of the, your response to Tim's question as well. Do you feel in your dealing with your interlo interlocutors from the mainland at so many different levels that there really has been a deepening understanding of the way that the people in Taiwan think, what makes them tick? And, and of course, Taiwan is now a very diverse, there's no monolithic uh, way of thinking. But do you think that they appreciate the complexity of Taiwan and are able to empathize with the viewpoints of when you you know, the cited figures, why do so many people oppo support the status quo or oppose um, reunification? Or is it basically learning from your answer to Tim's question, it's almost as if they become more sophisticated at learning how to manipulate, uh, manipulate these differences in Taiwan as opposed to saying, yes, we understand it and now we want to do something to help, help you achieve your, your kinds of goals and allay fears. Um, this this is also you know a very tough question uh, in a way. Um, what does mutual trust really means? I mean, is there hundred percent mutual trust, or sixty percent, you know, or below fifty percent? At what level, beyond which one can say it's a mutual trust, and below which it's not? You know, can we quantify uh, mutual trust? It is simply a cognitive matters, you know, or quantitative matters, whatever, I don't know, you know. But even still, uh, despite of what I say, that, uh, you know, at least officially and verbally, uh, Beijing has said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, then strip uh, President Ma's, uh, you know, one China and, uh, you know, 92 consensus, whatever, uh, important foundations for mutual trust, you know. And then uh, from time to time, one also hear uh, from certain officials uh, of China mainland who say that uh, uh, the official trust is not really quite there yet. There is, there is room uh, to improve. And so I, I sometimes feel puzzled, you know, uh, what, what, what more room do you want? Do you want to feel? I don't know. You know, uh, to reach the levels 100 uh, uh, percent accept acceptability uh, in, in terms of trust. My feeling is that uh, you are quite right uh, in my observation that uh, China is becoming very able, you know, um, uh, to take advantage of uh, Taiwan's open society. Okay. Uh, this is a this is a fact of life. Uh, that is to say that uh, there is a, a symmetrical uh, relationship between both sides. One is bigger, one is smaller, one is more open, one is less. You know, and so in the case of Taiwan, smaller, more open, uh, and and also you know uh, uh, heavy reliance on China in terms of economic interests and so on and so forth are more liable uh, uh, to initiative penetration from the other side and, and tend to be, uh, on Taiwan's side, tend to be more reactive in that sense. Okay. Um, at the bottom of their heart, even among those who frequently travel to China, how much of them uh, are able to cult cultivate personal friendship, for example, with their uh, friends in China, with group in China, you know, 
I don't know. I think uh, maybe this require more uh, intensive uh, survey, yeah, to find out uh, what deep down people are thinking. But one thing one can say, though, uh, that uh, even though uh, the economic benefits uh, are there, especially to those who have invested in China, especially to those who have uh, product, uh, you know, export into China, you know, it's a beneficiary, right? And um, the number is quite huge. But yet, uh, the opinion poll also show that there is still a very li large number of them uh, politically feel uh, suspicious of China, you know. So there is not a direct kind of a linkage between politics and economics, you know. That, I'm sure, will be uh, very puzzling or uh, something, you know, quite, quite bother, bothersome as far as, uh, you know, Beijing is concerned. And I, I, I feel that they are continuing to try that. Uh, this year, you know, they, they are moving into the territories of the strongholds of those who, who are what I call China suspects. You know, uh, precisely those uh, who don't have that uh, much trust yet. And uh, with more frequent visit to China or, or more material type of contact or convergence of economic interests be able to change that? I don't know. You know, uh, it, it would take probably longer. And I, I'm hoping that the Chinese leadership uh, the next generations of Chinese leadership, um, hopefully they will take that into account. Okay. That's the best I can do, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. Tin, thank very you. much for this presentation.